Hi there. Um, wow, wow, wow. First, I want to I'm going to do this. Um, a big part of how we're going to do this is through services. So what I was going to talk about today is I was going to do a quick overview on um, what SOA is, why SOA, and then in particular for quality student, why SOA. Um, next, we'll talk specifically about what's, what's in a service contract. After that, we'll review service classification. We've got a system that's primarily um, around governance. And so we'll talk through how that fits into, again, um, a project as complex in the, as this is and also a collaborative project. Um, and then I'll go through a little bit on what, how the service design process works, what our interaction is. We're slap in the middle of the business side and the implementation side. And so um, we'll talk a little bit about how that process goes. We'll uh, do a quick review of artifacts, and I've provided some links to all our artifacts that we're working on right now. And then we'll talk through a couple of examples. So why SOA? Um, SOA is really a discipline. It's a set of principles and methodologies for designing and developing software in the form of interoperable, ser interoperable services. That's important because it allows us to start to section off the system into pieces that can both be reused or replaced, depending on what a particular institution's needs are on a module by module basis. And let me go sideways. I don't mean module like ENR. I mean pieces within enrollment. Sorry, there I go using acronyms. Um, it's based on well-defined business functionalities that are built as software components. So the idea is that it's business that's driving the definition of these components. And then these are in pieces so that they can be reused. So reuse is a big advantage of it. Um, I'm going to say productivity increases eventually. Initially, there is a, a pretty big investment, especially if you've got a, a project team that um, service-oriented architecture is new to, which is some of what we've been experiencing as a quality student team. Um, and then eventually increased agility. The strategy advantages are really better alignment with the, um, with the business office. So I want to pause here and talk a little bit about why KS is so important, um, why service-oriented architecture is so important to quality students. Um, a key aspect to how we're going to really support all the functionality you've heard about for the past two and a half or is it three hours um, is really by leveraging services. One of the key cornerstones of services is really this idea of type and state. Um, at, the, at the low level, you have a learning unit, a learning unit of type course is how we get to the business definition of the concept of what a course is. So the type state configuration is a, is a big component of how we're going to not only build out all the additional types of learning that we need, but also in how institutions will be able to start to make it um, work specifically for them. Another big aspect of services is really the dictionary. Um, the dictionary is just, just like it sounds, but it also lets institutions start configuring really what the requirements are, all the way down for, at, a, at a data level. So what, um, what, what is required, how it's labeled, how it's referred to. A third aspect of configuration is really rules. And um, you know, rules uh, is, is a little bit of a, a broad category from a functional perspective, but when we get down to it, uh, eventually we'll have actual rules. We have um, a statement service that uh, is a wrapping. It was heavily used in, in the curriculum management for really um, configuring and defining all the requisite rules. Underneath that now, though, is a quality um, foundation tool. We have the KRMS, which is Quality Rules Management System. This is currently being heavily used by COEUS. And as part of the proof of concept that the development team went through in Core Slice was really attaching, connecting our front end um, require, course requirement uh, definition service to the KRMS for actual rule execution. So over the course of this next year, that integration is going to become much more um, crucial. Um, circling back to the why services, services also one of the big advantages is it really gives us a layer between the UI and the back end implementation. This is going to allow a couple of things. Back on the productivity on the development side, it'll let teams be expert in one or the other or, and or move independently. The other thing from an institution perspective is it's going to allow some configuration at that UI level as well. 
Can I hear a pause? <laughs> uh, so what is, what is a service contract? Um, it's a, a, the contract is a definition of operations or functions. These are really the things that will start to line up and support a business level um, function. And then their message structures. And the message structures are really the logical data objects and parameters that are required in order to accomplish that particular function. Um, the contract implementation is really now, so, so that's really just a definition. That's just an agreement. It's a formalized definition. The contract implementation really has, has a, a back end part where those functions then have to be landed, so to speak, in terms of code that will actually implement and persist that data layer. Once that's in place, now I've got pieces that the application layer can pick up to deliver features. That's part of the role. The other part, like I said, is going to be that UI layer. So the services are really right in between. Um, a couple of the key points that I think um, as we go through and, and, and uh, make sacrifices on what we can and can't meet in terms of delivery with our reference implementation, sometimes you'll hear that, well, the service supports it. Um, Carol's helped me to be more articulate about that and, and be clear as to whether it's the contract definition that supports it or whether we actually have a back-end implementation that supports it. Or if, as when it shows up in the reference implementation, there's actually a UI um, use of that implementation. So, so that's going to be, I think, helpful as um, institutions. You start trying to understand how far down the path of any particular um, delivery of feature have we gotten. Um, the other piece is really that message structure and the data. The data is, um, is obviously very critical for, for the um, institutions, and I think that vetting, all of that data has, has to have a place to live. There will, may be cases where we say if it's a really then we might recommend a dynamic attribute. But anything that's generally agreed on by the community as a data element that needs to be included should show up in that message structure. Um, a couple of things. This abstract layer, why invest in this? This piece should say, in the, in the last, um, sorry, going sideways. In the last slide, um, there was a picture of an, of a, an, an electric outlet. And um, the first time someone started describing services to me, they sort of said, you know, it's, it's like that outlet. And, and what's so beautiful about that is I can plug, if, if I agree on that interface, the interface of a three-pronged plug, one of which is optional, as you know, I can now, anything can plug into that. In the back end, I really don't even care how it's wired. If I've agreed on that interface, I can supply electricity to any number of things. So that's you know, maybe a stupid example, sorry. Um, what it does is allow you to have a stable layer that can continue to allow both sides to evolve or swap out, depending on what an implementation needs to do. Let's talk about classifications of services. Um, in R1, we have this idea of, uh, and again, those of you who have been on the project will remember some of this, of an entity service and a business service. Um, that was helpful because these entity services, it turned out, were really abstract and really hard for developers to sort of grasp and connect the dots between what a feature might be and what that entity service was offering. And a business service on top of it. Um, that would allow us to start thinking about the, the two big ones in curriculum management, of course, were course and program. And what that allows us to do is say, let's have a whole service devoted to course, the implementation of the LU service with the type of course, similar with the, with the um, program. That works fairly well. Um, but as we move into a broader project and started looking at how we're going to have to support parallel development, we realized that we needed to be more deliberate about our classification system. We also realized that in some cases, um, as with course, it was relying not just on one class one or entity level service, but many. LOs were in there, orgs, organizations were in there, learning units were in there. Um, so we needed to sort of um, be more deliberate about what those classes meant. So what we've come up with is a, right now a four class system. Class one is a single focus, self-contained, it's atomic. It may or may not be in business speak. For instance, learning unit, 
you know, those who have been on the project for a long time might know what a learning unit is, but it's not as, as, as tangible as course or program. Learning objective is very tangible. Learning um, result catalog or learning result record are, again, fairly um, um, abstract in nature. Comment and document are very deliberate. The key here is all of these are atomic and that there's one database entity that's really being managed by that class one. It's also one that it's expected to be composed to support class two services, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, the class ones are really going to be very tightly governed by the core service team. This is to make sure that at that, at that next level up, that base level of functionality, um, we don't allow a lot of variance. These services, this level service, should be fairly stable and should not have to change a whole lot as we move into parallel development. These services are composed services, so they are um, in business speak at all times. So course program, course offering, course registration, these are all examples of um, class two services. While we are getting as far along as we can in this um, enrollment setup period, which is another name for course life development period because we had two goals there, um, we do expect changes by the parallel teams. Um, but again, this is part of the core of what Koali student is going to be delivering, so there'll be rigorous review as part of that. <laughs> Class three services are really for KF contributions. They aren't part of the KF proper, but may become so. So UW's my plan and Sigma students' um, financials are two great examples of that. On both of those projects, um, we will consult and participate as much as possible, <laughs> depending on resources. Um, but really, for those to become part of, of KS proper, they would have to be, I can't believe I'm going to use this word, but they'd have to be qualified, <laughs> which means they'd have to go through that rigorous review to ensure that they're really up, up to the standards that we need in order to um, provide that stable base of, uh, of services. Um, the next classification of services that we have are right services. Um, the big, and this is, you know, Q and Kim and KRAD and KRMS and all those other K services that we know about. Um, that one's tr a little trickier and deserved its own classification in that Kowali student can't really control or manage those on our own. We have to go through a, a shared um, Kowali working group governance structure in order to uh, pull those off. Um, given what uh, the size of the RICE team is currently, one big issue for us is going to be um, the fact that we're probably going to have to devote some KS resources as we go along to augment some of those other base things. I'm thinking of KRMS and KRAD in particular right now. So how do we do it? Um, Carol and, and her team of very capable SMEs and BAs um, creates a bunch of artifacts as part of the business analysis process. Um, the first thing that the service team does is really review those high-level artifacts and start grouping those into areas for use cases. What this does is allow us to make a first stab at even what are the boundaries, what should be a service, how do we break up things like um, the learning record result, um, are we going to separate out as we have done the learning um, record catalog, which is really the definition of, of, of those learning results from the actual assignment of those to a particular student. I've included a link here. Um, I'm a little hesitant to jump off right now. I have no idea how I'm doing on time, but I think I've bought a little time from Steve, so. Yeah, you're, you're fine. You're fine Okay, let me see if I can jump over there then and show you this. Yeah. Now, okay. Kathy, I think you're only sharing your, uh, your PowerPoint. Oh, man. So it's all, yeah. We, um, why don't we go, well, what do you think? I need advice, Carol. Um, can, you, can you just stop sharing and then reshare and share your desktop? Can. That'll work. Or I can't see anything. Ah, there it is. <laughs> and you may just want to bump up the... I'm sure. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. Okay, so let's uh, flip over here. So, um, and you'll have to let me know how this looks from a um, 
You need to bump it up, probably. A couple of control pluses. How's that? I think she got rid of the left hand. Nope. Yeah, can you get rid of the left hand nav? There we go. How's that? Yeah. Maybe one more. Landing. There you go. How's that? Oh my god, I have a giant screen and it's like, I could stand on the other side of the room. Um, so you can see, similar to the classification um, system that we just talked about, uh, oh, interesting, class twos aren't on my automatic thing. Um, but this is a list of all the services. This is actually what I've been using to kind of manage the process, but it's also a great way to get an index to whatever the work, work in progress is. So for instance, you can see here's the academic calendar service which if I open that up will actually take me to the contract definition, which is in the other link I was going to show you, our service repository. We can come back to that. And then there's also a link to what we call our sandbox. Um, tread with caution in the sandboxes. They are very much our working areas and a conglomeration of a lot of um, good ideas and some not so good ideas. Um, but, but, it's, but it's important to uh, keep that in, in mind. Um, and then, you know, a couple other things on here which you're welcome to delve into or not. Some of the status on how we are doing for course life, for my plan, and then for overall parallel development. So that's one um, issue. I'm actually going to go back now and continue. So anyway, that's a great way to follow, uh, follow the action. Um, the next thing that happens is there's this very um, collaborative process that happens with the um, business analysis team and the UX team to the degree possible, um, and then with some um, checkpoints in with the development group. Um, and that's when we really dig into each, each high-level business area, like course registration or course offer, and uh, we start to get into the details of the service. At that point, we start defining the um, logical entities, we start exploring the service layering, and we start defining some of the functions and data bits. A lot of this activity you'll see initially in our sandboxes, but then as that gets more refined, let me go ahead and that, then you will see actual formal contracts be developed. And I'm going to pause for a second and share a little bit more. So this is our service description repository. This is the area, I'm sorry there where um, these are the services that we've actually delivered as part of the course life development process. So we can just randomly, oh, go look at academic calendar service. And in here, there are some um, artifacts. And actually, you know what, I'm going to come back to this because we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what some of these artifacts are. Um, going a little bit, yeah. But, but here's where you will see um, wiki-based definitions of what they are, logical diagrams, a layering diagram since this is a class two and there's a class one underneath it, and then eventually down here you'll get to an actual definition of the contract. I'm going to bring this home for you in a minute when we go back to the PowerPoint. Um, this is where you're going to see the actual operation and then the actual message structures, which are going to hold all the data. So if you follow this trail, you will see how we're gluing together and supporting, either at a class one level or a class two level, the definition of uh, the support for those features. I hope I haven't gone too far astray. Um, the final thing is that, again, for those contracts that were actually in the repository, we're going to actually have not only those wiki artifacts that we were just looking at, but we're going to have code artifacts. And I know this probably doesn't matter for most of you, but for, if there are any technical-ish people in the room um, and you have access, this is our branch where we're actually um, putting our services. And in here, you can dig in and see all the code you want to. I will blow past that one for now. So that's, that's what happens as, as we do our initial release of the service which is what needs to happen before development can actually get their hands on After that, there's sort of this, this process where um, we do a lot of refinement. And so that refinement might be in a missing operation. It might be a missing parameter that we had in that operation. 
Um, but at this point, we start moving into uh, what's now an informal process, but as part of parallel development, we realize that we need to formalize it, and that is actually a release process for the service contract. So um, at, at that point, we will then be having development might be working off a 1.2 version of the service contract. We will be continuing with that analysis and design process pushing that contract, and we might actually be developing on the next release of that. So this is going to give us, right, right now we're a little bit more um, overlap than there should be. So the artifacts, we just kind of looked at that. And, and again, I'll, I'll encourage you to, to um, definitely anyone from a business or SME perspective can, can consume the wiki level artifacts. So there's a narrative description that includes assumptions and key concepts for that particular service. There's an entity diagram, which again, very important not to confuse it with the uh, data um, um, ER diagram. This is actually a logical representation of what should happen. There's still a level of design that will happen from um, in terms of the database design and persistence. Um, then if it's a class two, that should be class two to class one, sorry a service layering um, that will actually facilitate um, the devs understanding how that maps to that class one service that in many cases has already been developed. Um, and then there's all the type state configuration. So all of that is all, you know, wiki, and it really will help you start to understand how we support all these various concepts um, in the form of um, the service uh, definition. Um, one of the big things that we learned in R1 was that our end point of a wiki-based contract was not always being consumed exactly by the developers. So we've actually changed our um, methodology. And I would say this has been a very successful part of what we've learned in terms of interacting with the development team. And I, I think the development, no, I know the development team will say this as well. We are now doing Java first contracts. So we're creating the interface for that contract. When you look at it on the wiki, that's actually a reverse um, presentation of the Java code into a, a, an HTML page that analysts can actually read and digest. So that was huge, because that means now the developers can start with that, that Java code as the first step of development. We're also developing beans for the message structures and implementing their interfaces. Um, whatever is required in terms of an interface, how it needs to present, again, I don't mean to you know, throw you with big acronyms, but I know there's definitely some people that do know what those words are, so I just included a few more pieces. Um, constant files for our types and states. Again, I think there was a lot of um, missing time and missing knowledge transfer. Whoa. Um, by uh, by not by by just having that as a as a wiki definition rather than an actual piece of code that could be consumed. Is that popping around for everybody? I have no idea why that's doing that. It is. Someone someone's hosting and uh, sorry. But yeah, no, it's just not your fault. Um, we're also doing the dictionary XML as a starting point. Again, these previously had all been developer tasks. Um, as we, again, have uh, learned and refined our process, um, a lot has happened between the developers and the service team um, in terms of teeing things up for successful application development, which is where um, you know, this group can circle back in and see how we're doing against requirements. So a couple of examples. I think this has been you know, outlined before, so I'm glad we're all saying the same thing. There's this very abstract learning unit. Um, it can be modeled to be anything big or small in terms of um, a, a, a learning again, I forget what your definition was, Steve, but you know, learning against a specific goal. Another one, though, is um, academic time period. And again, I think in, in R1, we only had the academic time period. We hadn't um, evolved to the academic calendar as a class two concept. Um, so some people might say, oh, ATP, that makes perfect sense. But it doesn't really. And ATP, is, if you can see, as it gets translated up into the class two service, could be a campus calendar. It could be an academic calendar. It could be a term. Any framing of time within which you might drop others. 
Um, the other aspect of the academic time period is this thing we call a milestone. And again, a milestone can be a single date, it can be a date range. Um, what we've surfaced up at the class two level is three distinct types of milestones. Um, and I'm going to go kind of from right to left. I probably should have switched those around. Um, the first one is, you know, when we looked at all our instances, we looked at, you know, everybody's got, um, so back to registration date group. Um, so what, as we went through the analysis and design process, it turns out that, um, you know, everybody has kind of a, a generic set of common registration and course related, you know, grades are due, really, really grades are due, or it's really, really late, you know, those kind of milestones. So we did two things at the class two level. First of all, we hardened or predefined all those that we had in common. Second, we actually grouped those so that as a, a developer, I can just go get that whole set as I'm trying to um, present or lay out uh, a, a term or an academic calendar. These kinds of things are how we start to really leverage the power that we have at a very abstract level underneath, but then try to make, tr turn it into tangible concepts at the business layer and facilitate. Had we not had that class two, there would have just been a whole bunch of work to do down at the class one level. Um, so that, that capability, that process, you will see throughout um, the analysis and design process of enrollment. Um, Carol, I, I think later is when you're going to your dashboard. Yes. OK, so when that happens, I will just point out now, while it's fresh on your mind, that you will see in there. Very pretty. Okay, so what I was going to point out is there you will also see and get a, a view into some of the thinking because on those A and D pages for each area, we've actually called out class one and class two. So you'll start to get a little bit of a, a view into how this um, service um, design process is working as we lay it out for enrollment. And I, I'm pretty sure that's my last slide. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop. I could certainly go through more pages on the wiki if anybody's interested. Carol, I'll leave it to you as to whether you want to reclaim the 13 minutes. Ms. Carol. Everybody. Is anybody out there? I hear you. Yep, I hear you. Here. <laughs> Okay, then I will um, defer to, uh, let's see, I'll put uh, Dan on the spot. Um, should, should I pause here and, and stop? This was the end of my presentation. Or, um, and the only thing I can think of with a couple extra minutes is to maybe walk through the artifacts a little bit more. But I don't want to bore people. The stuff I love, but. <laughs> Which Dan were you talking to? You. No. Oh. Do it. I, I'm not sure what happened to um, Carol, but I think the next section is hers. So maybe I'll just fill the space until we get. Uh, oh, we can't hear you. Uh, Kathy, Kathy, Carol is trying to talk on Skype. To um, oh, apparently okay. she's having trouble being heard. Yeah, we can't hear you at all, Carol. <laughs> Kathy's um, going to try calling back in. OK. Again, I'll just kill a little bit of time. <laughs> um, yeah, that was good, Kathy. <laughs> I, uh, again, I, 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 I do encourage folks, as you're starting to 
embrace an area and how are we as KS going to solve a problem? How are we going to provide the functionality um, to, to, to read through these? Not only because I wrote most of the descriptions and they're good, but because I think they're now? really helpful. Just kidding. Can you hear us now, Kathy? Yes. I can stop. I was filling time. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. I, that was weird. All of a sudden we were just, we were an, on mute somehow. Um, okay. That was terrific. Um, I guess I just want to close the loop for the functional people, um, and maybe you talked about that while we were gone, Kathy. <laughs> but uh, it's really particularly for, um, particularly for the BAs who are going to be working on the project, you know, understanding the business, understanding the service contracts, understanding the message structures, all that's going to be really critical to your work. And this is, I think, maybe, I think Kathy did a really nice job of setting up how the work that the business analysis team does really feeds directly into the service contract design, which in turn really, really constrains the, what functionality can ultimately be delivered. So this is the really important, I think, the critical touch point between the requirements and what product eventually gets delivered is at that service contract layer. So one thing, Carol. Um, what's that? One thing. What? I guess not. Never mind. What did you say? I was I was just going to say I, I want to you you use the word constrained and I just want to say it's more the framework for it, it is not our intent to constrain what can be delivered. Oh uh, no! I'm yeah. What I mean, if we don't get it right, for the business analysis side, if we don't feed the service contract properly, if we don't understand the service contracts, if we don't, you know, do our due diligence to make sure that our needs are getting represented, it could ultimately constrain. It was more trying to say that it's important for the BAs and the SMEs to some extent to understand the service contract. This isn't, you know, it's part of our work, I guess. Is Absolutely. What All right. I'm going on mute. Okay. <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps I didn't do it very eloquently. A little shaken by all the activity. Um, 